Hello everyone, my name is Tina Peermine and I'll be moderating the webinar today. I just wanted to say a massive welcome to everybody. The event, What is Domestic Abuse, is part of the 16 Days of Action to end gender-based violence. Kent Integrated Domestic Abuse Services have 16 events running between now and the 10th of December to inform, educate and inspire action so that we can make domestic abuse everybody's business. Because de domestic abuse is everybody's business and everyone can make a difference, which is just what you've been doing by attending today's session. So thank you very much. During the event, you are able to use the question and answer text box on your screen to ask questions to Rebecca Swain, who is today's guest speaker. As moderator, I will publish these and ask them at the end of the session. Rebecca Swain will be speaking for approximately 30 minutes and we will then have 30 minutes for questions. I just wanted to note that your email confirmations show that the webinar is slightly longer. This is so we don't get cut off the system. You can use the thumbs up just underneath the question to upvote a question if this is something you'd like to ask as well. If you'd like to follow up on the question, please preface the question with the words follow up. So this just leaves me with the wonderful job of introducing my colleague, Rebecca Swain. Rebecca has been working with women since 2006 and she qualified as an IVA, an independent domestic violence advisor in 2011. Her work has taken her into different settings, but she has the same goal to make domestic abuse a subject we all speak about and that no one who is in need of support feels alone. Rebecca raises awareness for professionals by way of specialist training and has a pilot, piloted a scheme in a busy A&E department to, to provide on-site support. Rebecca also specialises in supporting men experiencing abuse and knows with complex needs. Rebecca loves being part of the Look Ahead team and is very delighted to speak in public when she can about the subject. So now I hand it over to Rebecca Swain for her webinar on what is domestic abuse. Thank you, Tina. Welcome everybody. Um, the, today we will be looking at an introduction into what is domestic abuse. We'll be covering some of the key facts and um, as Tina said, I've been working in this field for some time in various different locations. Um, I would like to just give you a trigger warning. So currently uh, we are aware that um, some of you joining us today um, may be have experienced domestic abuse, may know someone who's experiencing domestic abuse. So what I ask is that if you find any of the content that we're talking about difficult today, um, please feel free to take a breather or to um, come back to us, take a few minutes. Um, one other very good technique is a tapping technique. So rhythmically moving your hands on a surface, maybe your knees or something like that can also help to, um, to, to sort of stimulate your parasympathetic nerve and help you to, to understand the, the feelings that you might be having. So the session this morning is an introduction. We're going to go through some of the, um, the, the basic facts about domestic abuse. And actually what we aim to cover with you today is the definition of domestic abuse, um, what it is, things that you may notice, but things that you may not notice as well. How to ask the question, what barriers there might be for engagement, what the victim wants, advice you can give, and signposting to other agencies. So let's take a look at the first type of domestic abuse that we're going to uh, discuss today, which is coercion and control. 
So prior to 2015, uh, there was no law around coercion and controlling behaviour. Until that point, um, we would be visiting as an IDVA, I would be taking clients to police um, and getting specialist support. And what they would be saying is, you know, an incident needs to happen. There is uh, nothing really that um, protects vulnerable clients around coercion and control. And I'll give you an example of, uh, in my working practice, coercion and control. Um, I had a client who was made to look for four marked one pound coins throughout the house. And if she didn't do that, uh, then she would be um, looking at an incident that evening or another um, an argument would, would ensue because her partner, her husband, felt that she hadn't done enough cleaning and therefore she hadn't found these mark one pound coins. Since 2015, we can use coercion and control. Um, it, it's, it's an, it's an offence to control somebody in a manner like that. So other manners might be uh, making suicide attempts. If you leave me, I will kill myself. Um, uh, using revenge porn, taking photographs and then uh, publishing them to your colleagues, your work, your friends, your family online. Um, threats to out you if you're in a same sex relationship. Um, to report you to social services, um, that, which is a very common form of controlling behaviour, uh, which leads to a lack in engagement with the essential services that actually, if you're experiencing domestic abuse, those services are there to, to help and support you. But that instills a fear um, that they're, uh, they're going to report you, your children are going to be removed, all, all the ways that a head worker might try to um, make you feel as if they've got the power and control. Pushing you to drop charges, witness intimidation. Counter allegations is another form of coercion and control. Um, controlling you through the courts, through child contact um, or involving you in illegal activity. So when I'm working with clients, what they say to me is that coercion and control um, they don't recognise, to begin with, the symptoms. And it's very difficult when you're in an abusive relationship to sometimes recognise these um, methods of coercion and control because domestic abuse is about power and control. Um, it's not down to other factors. It is down to a choice of one person um, to be abusive towards another or, or group of others. So when we're looking at coercion and control, the walking on eggshells type of feeling is something that a lot of clients will report. They manage the situation. They try to keep everything calm um, to avoid an incident. And actually, that is a, a very damaging form of control, not only for our, our mental health, but for our physical health as well. And domestic abuse is linked to several health conditions. Um, such as fibromyalgia, um, gastric disorders. You know yourself if you are nervous. I am a little bit today. Um, and your, your stomach will let you know that there are nerves. Um, if you've got an exam, that, that will go straight to your stomach, otherwise known as your little brain, and cause you to feel, you know, jittery tummy. And that is, um, you know, your... your um, your nerves will then release hormones, which then have a detrimental effect on, on your body. So coercion and control, a lot of clients say to me, is actually um, really, really difficult to live with, um, really difficult to understand. Uh, those behaviours become normalised. Actually, what becomes normal to the person experiencing abuse might look very different to someone um, who has never experienced abuse. And therefore, it can be hard to explain. It can be hard for other people to understand. How can you possibly disclose to someone who um, doesn't understand the dynamics or the effects of um, abusers and such as coercion and control? Economic abuse. 
Um, economic abuse can manifest in many different ways. And I think when we look at what we've got on the slide here, preventing employment, um, and now that could be stopping you from getting promotions, stopping you from taking overtime, stopping you from having access to your own funds. Controlling and taking your money is very difficult if um, uh, the perpetrator is the, the the wage earner, the client is not able to um, get a job or anything that earns a significant um, amount because there is control there and um, uh, diff difficult to be able to provide for your family um, in working practice. I've seen this quite a lot and um, Clients have sometimes had to uh, work for, for money to be able to buy the children essentials. So it's a constant struggle to be able to, to, to manage the, the household income when actually you have no control over it. I had a client whose um, one particular child of hers was disliked by the perpetrator and he would actually go and do the weekly shopping and not buy any items that he knew that this particular child um, favoured and therefore mum would have to go and beg to the perpetrator to get that money to be able to go and buy the, the food for this one particular child um, which created a very very difficult dynamic in the home and um, the child felt singled out the mum felt like she wasn't protecting that child and 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 that controlling type of behaviour really was very difficult for her to manage. Um, using money for drugs and alcohol. So if your perpetrator is using drugs and alcohol, if you as a survivor strategy are using drugs and alcohol and um, you, you don't have the money for that, that can lead into criminal activity, um, payday loans, um, and again, that leads into taking loans and debts out in somebody's name, credit cards, using that credit card um, uh, w without consent. Um, all of this can lead to economic abuse. There is another side of economic abuse that actually um, came, it, it became more apparent to me working in West Kent than any other area. So currently, the, the average cost of a, I think it's a three-bedroom semi-detached house in Tunbridge Wells is around half a million pounds. So imagine the scenario. You live in a house worth half a million pounds. Your perpetrator is the main breadwinner. You have two children. Let's, for example, have Timmy and Tabitha. They both go to private schools. Um, Timmy loves doing ballet, Tabitha loves doing rugby. If you live in a half a million pound house, you will have difficulty accessing some of the, the other options that are available to you. Legal aid, uh, your threshold might be met for legal aid, so therefore you may not be able to get legal representation. Um, if you can't access any benefits because you've got savings in the bank, um, which could be in a joint bank account, so that would be very difficult to have access to. Um, you are then in a position where your perpetrator is uh, controlling which schools your children go to by paying their bills, um, what car you drive and where you drive it, the mileage could be checked. Um, you could be in a situation where actually having money in an area where um, house prices are high and there could be savings, that it's actually a barrier to support. So that's very important to, um, to understand with your client or your, uh, the person that you're working with um, what the economic situation is and, and how you would then get access to the help that you would need, um, so say legal help um, or, or refuge, for example. I think when we all think about uh, domestic abuse, we all think about intimidation. The nature of a domestic abuse relationship is that it is around power and control. And control can be used to create fear. And I think that's probably one of the, the, the sort of common ways that we all think about um, of, of being controlled and experiencing that fear. 
But how would it feel to, to feel fear just by a look from another person? Um, when I worked in the A&E department, my biggest allies were the ladies on reception. They would sit for four hours um, observing the dynamic in, in a relationship. They would be able to pick up on body language. Um, they would be able to understand the fear that some person, other person may feel by by someone trying to use power and control. And I think if you've ever watched um, uh, Sleeping with the Enemy, which is a, a film around domestic abuse, he does do a lot of control just by a look, a gesture. It doesn't need to be um, a, a word or um, you know a physical act. Actually, that intimidation um, could just be with a cough or a... Uh, I know one perpetrator who um, sat in a court um, stretching his knuckles and making them crack, which nobody else actually picked up on in the room other than the victim, because she she knew that at that point that was a warning for her. And that was an intimidation in front of a, a courtroom full of people. And actually, she was the only person who who understood that. Someone's physical size or ability. If you are um, experiencing abuse by someone who may have, um, uh, you know, martial arts background, of course, that's going to make you more fearful. Um, actions or gestures, again, the, the whole clicking of the knuckles is, is a way to, to show a client that might be experiencing abuse that this is, this is a warning, this is, this is a threat to you. Destroying your property. Um, quite often perpetrators um, will look at uh, your personal belongings and actually destroy the things that matter to you most. Um, family photographs, um, deleting photographs from devices that, that may have been stored on there for several years and, and therefore you lose a lot of your, you know, your personal things. Um, I do know where things have been, been, you know, like deliberately targeted to promote that emotional response from, from the client um, the, of, of items that just have a, a high sentimental value rather than a high um, actual value. Abusing your pets. Um, this, you know, pets can be used to, to harm as well. Um, I do know at one point I had a man who had two fighting dogs um, that he would use to control his, his victim. And bragging about previous abuse. So if someone is telling you that they've previously harmed someone or that they've previously um, been, you know, involved in, in hurting other people that is going to instill a fear into you a fear of intimidation a fear that that might happen to you and actually what starts is that drip 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 effect of power and control and um, fear uh, economic abuse finding yourself in a position where um it all feels that it's becoming a bit overwhelming who do you speak to um, this could be someone who's walked into your place of employment or this this could be someone you're trying to support. So when we're looking at domestic abuse, it is this multifaceted um, scenario. There's there's rarely just one um, incident or one type of abuse that, that can be perpetrated against another. And when, when I'm talking about domestic abuse and perpetrators and victims, I'm not a huge fan of the word victim. Um, I prefer survivor. Um, I know that in our professional worlds, um, you know, we are trying to make domestic abuse feel less like a subject that we can't talk about. The whole purpose of this, this is to make DA everyone's, uh, everyone's business. So using the word victim is actually um, something that I try not to do. Um, I also try not to separate between male and female um, victims and perpetrators. So um, for the purpose of this session, we will be using victim and perpetrator. Isolation, a really common form of 
domestic abuse. Imagine you are a client who has a large family. Your large family are saying to you, why are you with this person who, who makes you feel these this way? Why are you with this person who doesn't allow you to have the money that you need? Why are you, um, you know, we, we're worried about you. We, we're concerned. And actually by isolating you from that friends and family network, the perpetrator then that has less of um, uh, a threat of the other people who might be trying to, to point out to you what, you know, what they see could be, could be happening in your relationship. Um, but also controlling your friends, making sexual advances towards your friends. And um, that's going to put a, you know, a rift between you and the people you love. And therefore the perpetrator will have more of an ear um, that, that drip, drip, drip effect that we spoke about before, um, you know, will, will start to sort of creep in and you'll be thinking, well, you know, maybe she wasn't my friend because actually, you know, Fred says that she made sexual advances towards him and you start to doubt yourself and start to doubt the, the relationships around you other than the one of the perpetrator because they are the ones that are reinforcing this over and over and over again. And it's not just the one form. It's not just isolation. It's not just economic abuse. It might not just be controlling behaviour. And, and that's what we as professionals need to be considering when we're working with anyone around what they might be experiencing. Accessing your social media. Uh, there was a court case, um, quite a famous court case, where uh, an assault had happened just prior to Valentine's Day. And um, the client had posted on, on Facebook how much she loved the perpetrator and how much um, she was thankful that she would be spending Valentine's Day with the perpetrator. And... At one point, this was questioned by um, by the defence. You know, why would you post something that you love your perpetrator? And this has just happened a few days before. And that that client's response was, "Could you imagine what would happen if I didn't post on social media that I loved my perpetrator?" And I think that is that is the key. Um, what we see on social media is not necessarily the truth. I think we we are all aware of that. Um, and actually, it's another form of control, um, making you, you know, post things that are um, around how happy you are or um, accessing what you can see, your friendship groups, deleting your friends. You know, these are all ways that are used to isolate us. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you've got a large group of friends on social media, of course, you know, you could lean on them for support. And the more that that perpetrator isolates you from that support network, um, the more control that they have. Hiding the car and house keys sounds sounds unusual, but it isn't. So if you're you're going out on you want to go out with friends, if you can't get to your car keys or you can't get back into your house, it's going to make you less likely to want to do those things. Um, and and using jealousy to justify their behavior, um, disability to control. If you live in an adapted property and your perpetrator is your carer, it's going to be incredibly difficult for you then to, to consider what the options are for you to be able to leave that, that relationship. Isolation is not just um, by the ways that we see here either. Um, isolation by location is actually quite common. Um, moving to areas where there are no friends and family or maybe it is a very rural location where if you ran out into the street, you know, it would be a mile or so before um, you, anyone would find you. So, again, um, you know, that, that should be taken into consideration when you're trying to support clients who are experiencing DA. So stalking and harassment, um, there's a very sinister uh, undertone to the stalk stalking behaviours. And I think we, you know, we've only got to look at some of the high profile stalking cases to understand that this is a situation that we as professionals must be responding to. 
Um, I can remember about 10 years ago uh, reporting to police. My client was receiving flowers every single day on her doorstep. And actually the response was, he must really love her. Those flowers were lilies. They were wreaths. Um, it's a very intimidating situation to have someone stalking you, you not knowing where they are, um, calling you up to tell you what you're wearing is is lovely or, you know, th this is a very um, concerning pattern of behaviour. Um, we're very fortunate in West Kent to have an organ excellent organisation, Protection Against Stalking, who I would recommend that if you have any issues with anyone you're trying to support, that you, you seek support from them um, and advice. Unwanted communication. So what does that look like? Um, a phone in your pocket might as well be the perpetrator in your room. They will constantly calling, 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 um, you know, this, this pattern of unwanted communication, making you feel pressured, making you feel as if someone is, is tapping you on the shoulder, is always looking, you know, into your world, because actually our phones um, can be a way to, to abuse us with not only sort of tracking devices, um, you know, find my phone um, application is a tracker. Um, if that, if your phone is registered to another person, your perpetrator, it's quite likely that they would be able to access that online and actually find out where you are. Um, if you are supporting someone, or you know you are um, yourself experienced in this, and you you find that where you go, coincidentally, um, so is that other person, then it's it's definitely worth asking the question around whether or not your phone has a um, tracker in it. Um, threats, threats to harm you, threats to harm others, um, your children, your family, uh, your pets, all of these are, are behaviours that, that we would expect to see um, from someone who's using a uh, stalking um, type of behaviours. Stalk or harassing a third party, um, friends, family, colleagues, um, if you are the person who is experiencing domestic abuse, you, you will want you know, to protect those that you love and the, the perpetrator will know that and they will use the things that you love most to to try and control and, and, and abuse you with. They could also use uh, the children uh, to, to abuse you. Um, children can be coached into using um, controlling and coercive behaviour, aggressive behaviour, um, foul language. Um, I have one client whose child actually didn't realise that their mum had a name. He thought that she just had a derogatory term, which I won't share with you because it's quite unpleasant. Um, but that child had, um, had instilled in him that actually mum didn't have a name. She was just called this. I think when we talk about domestic abuse, we, um, you know, we all ex understand that there is obviously physical and sexual abuse. Some of the examples here of, um, you know, beating and kicking and burning. Um, and I have seen both male and female victims um, with these injuries. Uh, the, the statistics at the moment, uh, one in four women will experience domestic abuse at some point in their life, but also one in six men will also experience domestic abuse at some point in their life. And as Tina alluded, I am a male um, I am specially trained to, to support men and actually burning is, is one of the key findings that I, I see in my clients um, with either cigarette burns, irons or, or hot water. Biting, um, that again is a very brutal personal way of, of injuring a person, um, stabbing and strangulation. As a professional, if someone reports to me that there's been strangulation, that does raise red flags for me, um, particularly uh, strangulation is a very personal form of um, putting your hands around somebody's throat to prevent them from breathing. You're looking directly in their, their eyes. It's a very personal um, form of, of violence and as a professional, if someone reports to you that there's been strangulation, whether that be 
um, in, a, in a violent incident or even if it's involved with um, unwanted sexual practice, that, that would raise red flags for me and um, that I would I would want to be seeking some specialist support for someone who reports that kind of um, abuse. So some of the statistics, 80% um, of clients are not visible to services. Why is that? Why is that we as a society are actually very good at child protection? Um, I'm a child of the 70s. My uh, mum would run around after us with a wooden spoon. And I think a lot of people who are born in that era are you are, are we as, as children, this this was normal behaviour. Yet, you know, now if we saw an adult running around the garden with a stick after a child, we would all feel morally obligated to pick up the phone and make and make a call to, to us you know an agency or, or get some help for that child so as adults um we need to be thinking the same about um adult safeguarding as well uh, and it's you know not just with domestic abuse but but in all aspects you know the the gentleman at the cash machine who might be uh, giving his money to to a gang of youths you know like these are all things that we as a society should be picking up on and we should be looking after each other um we still don't talk about domestic abuse. If if we did, we wouldn't need to title this seminar, uh, you know, DA is everyone's business. I've delivered training and people have said to me, yeah, I hear the neighbours next door. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what I should do. You know, like we all have a responsibility to safeguard each other. And um, we, we as a society will should be looking after our adults just as well as we now look after our children um and and that that's something that i i firmly believe that that we need to be looking out and reporting if we hear someone who is being abused or um uh you know seeing some sort of uh, of incident i would never suggest you interfere i would suggest you call the police so for those who are in domestic abuse situations, a quarter of those people live with abuse for 20 plus years. Um, I could give you some other statistics. 3.5 years is the average um, length of a relationship that somebody will be in before they seek support. Um, and by us breaking down those barriers, I would love to see that being reduced um, that that amount of time in an abusive relationship uh it becomes so entrenched it's so difficult for someone to seek support it's it's hard for that person who's lived there all that time um trying to manage those kinds of of behaviors and actually everyone has a right to live abuse free So what you might notice as a professional is a person who might seem withdrawn and depressed um, with low self-confidence, uh, feelings of shame. When I speak to the gentleman I support, this is one of the key highlights. They feel embarrassed that they're experiencing domestic abuse. They feel that there's a lack of worth because you're experiencing domestic abuse. Actually, you know, to experience DA can come out the other side is, is an achievement. It is um, something we should all be proud of if we can move someone through uh, and from an abusive situation to a place of safety. And as professionals, you know, we have, we have a duty of care to offer support to that person. Um, having injuries that do not seem consistent with the explanation, um, I spent a year in an A&E department and actually I felt very privileged to be in that position, to be able to um, see someone who is scared and frightened and reach out to that person and offer them immediate support right there and then in, in the A&E waiting room, uh, private room, but um, to be able to explain to them that they don't have to... Um, you know, this injury isn't consistent. They don't have to to repeat to somebody, you know, the, 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 the situation. They can actually trust someone who understands um, and to be able to offer them support um, right there at point of crisis. But what I did see actually was a lot of uh, health professionals struggling to, to understand that domestic abuse um, 
the dynamic and I felt once that we managed to broach that with with the professionals actually they felt much more confident to ask the the clients and and then by giving them the tools that they needed to be able to have this conversation to to see inconsistent injuries um, and and to open up the channels of communication because uh, again you know health play a major role and they're in a perfect position to be able to understand DA and have that conversation with with a client at that point of contact. And technology use as social media platforms being monitored. So um, I did touch on this a little bit with the stalking. But again, you know, we are fortunate to have a cyber clinic in West Kent where we can have our um, we can make appointments for clients to have their devices checked for for trackers. Um, for people who might have access to their emails and be able to monitor their movements through their diaries. Um, all of these are tools at, at, at your disposal here um, and, and look ahead to support the, the cyber clinic along with protection against stalking. Um, negative coping strategies. Um, my colleague and I um, do a lot of training around survivor strategies. Uh, we both work with complex need clients. So that could be clients who are experiencing um, issues with drugs and alcohol, um, with homelessness, um, with, with mental health conditions. And, and what we aim to do is to try and help other people understand that if someone is using drugs or alcohol, that may well be a survivor strategy. Um, if someone can't engage with you um, because another person is present, then that is their survivor strategy. And we should all be thinking about um, somebody else's survivor strategies um, and taking a really non-judgmental approach to those. Because um, once you can provide a non-judgmental approach to your client, you will then start to understand what their survivor strategies are. And those survivor strategies might have kept them alive for 20 years. So it's really important that we as professionals understand what those are and, and how we work with those. I think we've already talked about economic abuse and the finances um, being controlled. And um, I will invite you to, to, to put some, some questions to me really soon. And um, we will be going over to some live questions. So if anyone has anything that they would like to start thinking about asking me, please feel free to put it into the um, Q&A and then I'll be able to answer your questions at the end. Minimizing language. Oh, it was just, it was only these are um, language forms that clients develop as a way to normalize the behavior um, of the person that they're living with. If we all went on a first date with someone who spat in our face, we would never go out on a second date with that person again. But that's not how domestic abuse works. Domestic abuse is a slow um, progress progressive um, form of abuse that actually um, starts to make us feel about whether it is our fault, is it our um, behavior? You know, if you didn't wind me up, I wouldn't have to do that. A perpetrator will tell you that. So then the person who's experiencing that abuse will start to think, well, maybe he's right. Maybe if I didn't do that, then, then that would prevent this. And this is the internal dialogue that continues and um, in, in someone who's experiencing domestic abuse, it's head. So essentially they become to minimize the behavior because if you stood at the school gates and told your friends at the school gates that actually, you know, this person had burnt you with a cigarette that night, they would not consider it to be normal behavior. But if that's something that's happening to you over and over and over again, it becomes normalized. So minimizing behavior is something that as professionals, we should be looking out for. And actually, if I have a client who is um, minimizing, it actually gives me a red flag to know that there's a lot more that I need to um to, to understand about that relationship. I need to spend more time getting the trust of that person for them to be able to disclose to me. We, are, I think we all need to bear in mind that that person might only be able to tell you what they can right now. And that might not be the whole truth. That might not be the entirety of what they're experiencing. But we just have to respect that that's what they can tell us at that, that moment. And that's how we build on that relationship. 
they might start to think that it's um uh, that that other person can be really lovely and you know the the times i've heard from from clients you know he's 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 not a great partner but he's a great father and i think that we have to start to challenge some of those um you know with our clients actually is a great father someone who's abusing the mother of their children um and and gently you can form those those relationships to be able to get that information and actually start to challenge some of those minimizing behaviors the one at the bottom there it's only when they drink alcohol is a factor for uh, domestic abuse, it can be as long uh, um, as well as drugs and alcohol, um, but it is not an excuse. It is not an excuse for abuse. If you're asking someone who's experiencing domestic abuse, there is one very simple way that I have learned over the years to ask somebody. You ask them in private, you ask them, um, is someone making you feel unsafe? Because if the answer is yes, then we have a safeguarding issue. Um, and then that needs further exploration. That way you're asking someone in a in a gentle way, is someone making you feel unsafe? Not are you being abused? Is someone abusing you? And I think it's a very good way of opening up that conversation. We would always recommend that you um, don't use any kind of facial expressions that show shock or horror. Um, we use a non-judgmental tone of voice and language. We try and keep the questions very open and we document the conversation, particularly if you, you know, you're raising a safeguarding alert within your um, work environment. Obviously, refer them on to specialist support. We don't expect people to um, become uh, domestic abuse uh, a, you know, overnight. But please, you know, we run we run schemes, we run training. Please look into your organization's DA policy and see if there's anything that you can do to arm yourself with more information around how to support those clients. You'll see some signposting on the screen there. And then I would love to be able to answer some of your questions. Tina, can I bring you in for some questions, please? I'd just like to thank you, Rebecca, for that amazing presentation. We have had lots of questions in. Um, I would like to just go to um, the first questions, who's had the, the most votes. Um, and this question to you, Rebecca, is how do victims of dom uh, domestic abuse demonstrate proof of their abuse? Okay, so there are quite a f oh, I've got an intruding cat. <laughs> um, there are quite a few different ways you can. Um, you can keep a diary. That's a really good way, uh, especially around controlling and coercive behaviour. Um, you can fill out an incident log if you are um, experiencing stalking type behaviours. Um, reports of uh, hospital visits, admissions, doctors, you know, tell your doctor if you're experiencing DA. Um, you know, it's it's very difficult to open up, but find someone who who you trust and and you know, try and get them to to understand your situation and help you to to keep a diary of, of those incidents. Um, obviously, there are police call out records, other ways like that. Um, that you can you can show proof of the, the situation that you're in. Um, if it's coercion and control you're experiencing, I will be running a workshop dedicated to this and I will be providing you with the tools that you need to be able to um, to prove coercion and control, which is notoriously difficult to, to try and uh, record. Oh, we've also got a question, Rebecca, is where do people go first um, with um, if they really feel ready to get help? Um, you can contact your local IDVA service. Um, IDVA is Independent Domestic Violence Advisor. That's myself, someone like myself, who will offer you um, impartial advice and safety planning. Um, you can uh, Google it in if it's safe to do so. Otherwise, you could speak to maybe your local authority. Every authority has, has an IDVA service available and, and they would be able to signpost you to anything in your area that might be able to help. Um, we also have one-stop shops in West Kent, which um, are currently um, running 
virtually so it would be um somewhere where you could get all the answers to what you might be uh, needing questions to in one place and um, hence why it's called the one-stop shop we have housing providers we usually have police we usually have um someone like myself um or other organizations that are there to 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 offer you advice in in that one particular spot thank you rebecca um we've had a lot of questions about um men uh, or perpetrators who are abusive to their partners um where can they um seek help perpetrators of abuse seek help and support there are programs for perpetrators um who, called the cdap program which i know runs locally in our area um, also, there are organisations, um, Respect can, can help you with uh, signposting you if you identify that your behaviours are, 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 you know, negative towards another person. I hope that answers your question. And how do you, um, um, victims of domestic abuse who don't speak um, their first language, language um, is not English, um, how do we um, help and support those people who are experiencing domestic abuse? Yeah, um, um, if English isn't your first language, there are so many resources available in other languages. The da uh, DASH risk assessment is available in, in, I think, about 10 or 12 different languages. Um, your IDVA service would be well equipped to be able to um, access uh, sort of professional lines where we can we can um, have an impartial interpreter one thing you must never do is involve someone from the local community or a, a family member to interpret for a victim it's very important that you you get somebody who is is completely um uh, apart from the situation a professional interpreter and we can do that via various different means so it it shouldn't be a problem it should not be a barrier to seeking support there's so many questions popping up, Rebecca. We try and get through as many as we can. Um, if someone is being um, really closely monitored and you're unable to ask this person in private, how would you go about reaching out to that person? That's a really, really good question, actually. Um, what I can do is give you some examples in various settings. So in multi-agency professional meetings, we will work with other agencies to create scenarios where we might be able to get um, the person who's experiencing domestic abuse on their own. Um, your health visiting team will create um, opportunities for children to be seen by the doctor and therefore we can coordinate approaches um, with health. Um, if you are in a health setting, um, you can maybe ask that person, um, to, you know, to be weighed. Um, we need to just take you to, to get you weighed or just to check your blood pressure in private. Um, if it's really impossible for you to ask that person, um, look ahead, provide a resource around, um, it is a pack of tissues. And on the barcode of those tissues, we um, have a, a helpline number. Uh, now we work with our partners to, to provide those with, the, with that. Obviously, again, it's about the safety of that client. If it's not safe for you to explain to them, this pack of tissues um, has a barcode on it, then it might be worth looking, you know, raising it with a manager to see if there are any other organizations you can bring in to try and um, create, create a scenario where um, you can speak to that person in private. What would be that would be better than than trying to um, speak to someone where, where there might be a risk present. Um, really important because that that person may never come back and seek support again or approach you for support if 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 the risk increases. Um, so I would say get advice and work with your partners to try and get that person into a position where you can speak to them in private. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Um, this question has had lots of votes and it's as a as a male what can i do to be an ally 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 so um, yeah got a bit tongue-tied then and to both male and females that are currently experienced domestic abuse and are survivors okay as a male i actually 
as a male or a female, I think we can all be allies. Um, you can you could join the white ribbon as a um, uh, I think it's an ambassador for the white ribbon campaign. That would be really good. That would give you some specialist training around domestic abuse. You could become a uh, domestic abuse champion, which is something that Look Ahead are really keen to progress. And this could be in your workplace or um, uh, you know, if, if you run a business or you you have a, a large organization, you could train to be a, a, a domestic abuse champion, get some um, information that way. But essentially making yourself domestic abuse aware, uh, attending sessions like today where you are um you know, uh, informing yourself on ways to actually support people. Um you know, I am more than happy to keep, uh, you know, I, I support men. So I am always looking for suggestions around um, the way that I can improve my practice. Um, so, you know, if, if you've got anything that you would like to ask me, feel free. Uh, please come to me as a male who would like to be an ally or who might be interested in one of our training programmes. Thank you, Rebecca. We've had quite a few um, questions about where can people... Um, purchase or get the tissues that you spoke about to hand out to um, those experiencing domestic mm -hmm. abuse anyone who's interested in those um would if you would like to email us separately we can work with you to provide you with some training uh, and the training packs and the tissues are part of that resource um so if you would like to to sort of message us privately and then that's something that we will certainly um look to look to provide you with and that links on very nicely, Rebecca, to a question. As, as professionals, what is the best training um, to complete to support families experiencing domestic abuse? There are lots of really, really good programs. And um, ones for families, the first one I would be thinking of would be the Adverse Childhood Experience, where um, you work with families to work with both mum, usually mum, um, uh, and the children and that way you are um, providing support not just for the primary victim you're actually looking at it from a holistic approach and what we're trying to do is um, ensure that all children are supported we know that 160,000 children in the UK live in high-risk households um, we need to support the the primary victim whether that be um you know a parent or a, a grandparent but also those children you know we all have a duty to protect those children and and to reduce the number of children living in those high risk households the ace program really does help um it's an amazing program because adverse childhood experiences you know they happen to us all um but what we're doing is we're equipping the entire family with a, with a way of 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 supporting each other and people have also asked about are there any signs or symbols um, that those who are subjected to abuse can use like people have seen it like on uh, social media like dots on hands and, and hand signals that is a really good question because i think um possibly you know this is my own personal opinion if that other person doesn't isn't equipped with the tools to deal with a disclosure actually a dot on someone's hand can, can be really dangerous um i do remember a little while ago on facebook um there was a you know text me um and i will check in with not me personally it was a it was a um uh, like a, a round robin kind of a thing if you're experiencing abuse let me know and I will message you every week to check that you're okay actually that's a very dangerous thing you don't know who that person might be being monitored by and um, if you feel that um you know if someone is experiencing domestic abuse and you can find a way to ask them that one simple question, is someone making you feel unsafe, then you know that you need to bring in um, a specialist agency or signpost that person to a specialist agency who can manage those risks. Um, you know, a dot on a hand is is a it could be a can of worms. Um, and again, we had this in the hospital where a really useful scheme was brought in of using a dot on a urine sample to be able to identify a client who's experiencing abuse. Well, that's great until you haven't got an IDVA on site and what you've got is a disclosure and no way of managing it safely. 
So I would always be 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 quite careful around um, not having the tools that you need to be able to to deal with a disclosure. Thank you very much. And we've received a question. Um, and this question is, what would you do if someone reports domestic abuse um, but does not um, want the help? I think that's that's quite, as Idvers, we, we understand that. Um, the average is 35 incidents before someone actually seeks help. Um, there could be a variety of scenarios that trigger that, that want for help. Um, we do always have to think about children safeguarding, first of all, but actually we also have to respect that um, that person you're working with is, you know, has a right to choose um, if they if they want to stay in that relationship. What I would say is none of us want to see um, a person who, who is experiencing domestic abuse, but you there's a cycle of change and actually, you know, that has to be worked through and we can encourage that. And the, the most important thing that we can do as, as people supporting um, uh, someone is to offer a positive response. We, we won't be judgmental. We won't try um, and say to them, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that because actually that's their choice. And as hard as it might be sometimes for for us to see um, someone not want the help out there, that is their choice and we have to respect their decision. Um, we must take all the relevant steps to safeguard, um, uh, you know, if someone's not got capacity or if someone uh, has children, if someone else close to them is being supported. But it, it can be one of the hardest things as, as someone supporting uh, in a supporting role is, is when that person does not want your support. But actually, the next time they'll remember that positive response that you gave and they'll think to themselves, mm, I know, I remember who gave me that, um, you know, that encouragement or someone who, who, who wanted to help me. And I'll either go back there or I'll seek somebody else like them. So it's that positive response is really, really important. And you might just be that professional that someone else has given a positive response to and they seek support from. <clears throat> Um, Rebecca, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the questions. There's so many um, questions that keep popping up. I'm sorry um, I didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, people have been asking because we've been mentioning a look ahead and our email address and things like that. Would you like to just quickly, briefly, just explain the organisation we work for so that yeah. people can contact us? Yeah. So Look Ahead provides um, uh, safe accommodation across the whole of the, the UK. But here in Kent, we, we are uh, the commission service for, for domestic abuse for West Kent. Uh, that means myself and my lovely colleague here, Tina, um, we are um, part of the domestic abuse service and um, we, we offer support directly to clients. Um, we run programs, we offer training and um, we're both really, really passionate about what we do. Um, that's why it's taken 56 minutes and I haven't stopped talking yet. Um, but yeah, if you've got any inquiries, please feel free. Um, I'm more than happy to come back to anyone who'd like to know a bit more. Brilliant. Well, that just leaves me to thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca um, Swain. <laughs> I got used to saying your second name. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm guaranteed that everybody will have got something um, from this presentation to go away and think about. Thank you to everyone who um, asked a question. There were so many coming through. I was finding it difficult to keep up with you all. So thank you very much. And that really added to our question and answer um, session at the end. A recording of this webinar uh, will be made to you um, available very shortly. Um, if you enjoyed this event, please do know that there's still time to register for upcoming webinars. So your um, journey doesn't need to end here so please go to um, www.daeverybodysbusiness.org to register 
there's plenty more and you'll be pleased pleased to hear that Rebecca Swain and myself have got many more <laughs> presentations to go. Um, we can also keep the conversation going with the hashtag DA Everybody's Business and hashtags um, No See Speak Out. If the talk today has raised anything with you personally and you'd like to find out more about the services available, please visit the www.derisicabuseservices.org.uk where you can find out more about how to refer to your local services and you will find ourselves at Look Ahead on there so you can contact us for any more support, advice and training if um, you'd like this. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tina, supporting me as always. <laughs>